I hope you can now. Um, this this parish of Tzchelus uh, is becoming more and more apparent and, and, and frequent here in uh, here in this day and age. And uh, we're Baruch Hashem we're to have Rav Ben Sion Tversky Shlita. There's a shochin of ours uh, a little bit north of us to uh, enlighten us on the uh, the facts of uh, the very the sugi of uh, Tchelis and um, looking forward. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. I have the uh, privilege to share this topic with you without any risk. I'll tell you why. First of all, uh, I want to thank the Zedichabi Rebbe and the Shul for uh, having this program. Um, the, the truth of the matter is that if there are scholars among you who have already um, looked into this subject, it's unlikely that you're going to hear anything new. Um, and if there are those among you who really have in-depth questions about the topic, my cousin Rabbi Chaim Tversky is here to field any questions you might have. Um, he has written extensively on the topic, and the truth is that I believe that his articles have made a huge impact on the uh, entire world in regard to this, to this topic. So what I really would like to accomplish here today is at least to entice you to look into the subject. Um, to give you enough background uh, that you should be interested to pursue the uh, concept of being able to be Mekayim and Mitzvah Saseh. Uh, it's very clear from many Akhreinim that if Tchelis is available that one risks a is the rise of Baltigra of diminishing from the mitzvahs by not using tchelis, by not wearing tchelis. So it's not just, as most of my friends like to call it, my mishigas. Um, it may be bordering on a isudaraisa on the negative side and a kio mitzvah asei on the positive side. <coughs> For some reason, the issue pushes a lot of emotional buttons for people. Um, I find that when you walk into a room and somebody's wearing tchelis, um, there are a, invariably a group of people around that person, some for protection, and others uh, because they're irate with the person. How dare you? So, in order for us to accomplish anything here, I really need for people to at least approach it for the next hour with an open mind. And in order to do that, there's two issues that I would like to get out of the way. The first issue, the most popular issue, and the one that creates the greatest amount of emotional response, is from the camp of people who say, the Zaydis Ammas Nishkatin. Our ancestors didn't do it, uh, who do you think you are? Where do you come off doing this if the tzaddikim of, of uh, yesteryear didn't do that? One of the answers that I believe came from my cousin, one of the responses to that is, well, I wonder if when you go to Eretz Yisrael, do you take off trumas and maestres from your fruits and vegetables because your zaydis did not do that either. And the reason they didn't do that is because they weren't in Eretz Yisrael, they certainly didn't have the produce of Eretz Yisrael in those times, and they didn't have the opportunity to take off Trumas and Meisers. So would one be foolish enough to argue that because they did not take off Trumas and Meisers then, that we should not do so today? That's ridiculous. What's more, and I believe is, is even more to the point, is that when the Radzin Rebbe, the Balat Chedis, the one who really paved the way for this the restoration of this mitzvah, when he launched his campaign, the response of most G'day the Yisrael was to reason with him on the issue. They did not resort to saying, Desai Desam Nishkatin. None of them said, they, they, none of them 
But primarily that was not their argument. So if we really want to do what our ancestors did, then we need to argue about it intelligently and not resort to ridiculous arguments of, well, if they didn't do it, we're not going to do it. Let's at least do what they did. And that is to debate the issue using the sources in Chazal and the Metzias on the ground. Having said that, the Beis HaLevi indeed did debate the Radzina Rebbe, and it's quoted in the uh, Sefer HaTcheles, from the Radzina Rebbe, and his argument listed there is as follows. He says, and I'm really, I, I want to be very careful, not just because of the honor of the Radzina Rebbe, who was a, uh, a Goy Noilam and, and a Tzaddik and a Kaddish and, and all that, the rest of that neat stuff, but um, it would really take away spending the time on, on what the Rudinus Rebbe's position was, what he thought that the, the actual trade, the chilozim was, will we'll simply take away more time from what we want to focus on today. But the Beis Levi there is quoted the concept of Mesoiva. Okay, that's the buzzword that, that gets everybody excited. How can we possibly approach wearing trailers today? if there's no Messiah for it. Now, there are two ways of packaging that argument. The Beis HaLevi is quoted there, said that one should not embrace the, what they were trying to argue was the Chilos and the Cuttlefish at the time, if it was something that was readily available throughout all the, time, all the ages, and it was also known how to use it as a dye. So if it was known to the dyeing industry, and it was known how to do it throughout all the ages, and despite that, it was not used to make tcheles, then that's what we call a negative messiah, meaning basically the messiah is saying, we knew about it, it existed, we still didn't do it, obviously that's not the tcheles. Now, the Rezina Rebbe responds to that, but that's what we call a negative Messiah. <laughs> the issue of, a pos- of requiring a positive Messiah, where someone would argue that we can't do something unless we can identify the Chilozah, because that's what my father and my grandfather and my great-grandfather said, that's a different argument. And that's an argument that's worth looking into. First of all, it's clear from the Achrayman, that numerous Achreinim write that it's entirely possible that the Chilozim will once again be found and identified using the Simonim given to us by Chazal. Clearly those Achreinim are saying that it is possible to identify the Chilozim without a Messiah. That's first and foremost. So, and there are numerous Achreinim that say that. Second of all, if one was really an absolute Messiah person, there are numerous things that you need to be very careful with. Just to throw out a few, there's no Messiah for Turkey being a kosher bird. Turkey is identified by Simonim. And if one believes that you need to have a Messiah for each and every detail of uh, given mitzvah or given iser, um, you probably have to kasher your kevin. <laughs> Similarly, some years ago, there was a great debate about a certain species of lulav called the canary lulav that was found. And at the time, all the Gedele Yisrael, again, identified it as being a kosher lulav using the simonim that were available to us at the time. The argument was not, we don't have a Messiah to suggest that, even though that lulav was not used up until that point. Um, those are just two examples. So, what's interesting is, is that within the base brisk, as they call it, within the briska field, there are those who quote the negative Messiah argument, which the, the one, that's the one that the Radzina Rebbe reckoned with, and, and took exception to. And then there are those 
who quote this positive Messiah and a great many of the Briska Talmidim themselves take great offense to it based upon the fact that they believe that it's an embarrassment to the um, Rabbanim of Brisk to quote such a thing because it simply flies in the face of many Achrayim who say that it is possible to identify using the Simonim given to us by Chazal. A moment of historical background. Radzini Rebbe, and I'm a, a, a great historical genius, I have things that happened recently and things that happened a long time ago. Those are my two. Anything that happened while I was alive is recent, before that is ancient. So in ancient history, the Radzina Rebbe lived somewhere in the 1800s, went and um, again, due to his, his passion and, and some say, and he writes about the, the fact that it is going to be necessary for the Big Day Kahuna, um, but that he had a Messiah from the Kajna Tzimagi that before Mashiach's time, the uh, Chilozen would once again be revealed and we would be able to be Mekayim the Mitzvah of uh, Tzitzis Bishle Musa using uh, Tchelis. I think it's important to know that there are Rishayim, the Balamor and others, who did, never wore tzitzis because they believed that the mitzvah of tzitzis was a necessity and if you don't have tzitzis, you should not be wearing tzitzis at all. Um, although that's certainly not the psak halacha, but you know, it's important to know that there is such an opinion. The uh, Redzim Rebbe set out, um, went to Italy and decided, based upon the research that was available to him at the time, that the cuttlefish was the, uh, that had this, this black ink, it was consistent with how he read uh, the Rambam and the other Simonim, and um, he found chemists that assisted him in producing a, a blue dye from, the, um, from this species of cuttlefish. Uh, at the time, there were, again, there were G'day Ailam who took it very seriously. The Marsham, the Berzhan, one of the Paiskim of all time, took it very seriously. And in his Tzavo, he had them bury him in his Begad that had the Tchelis. Again, he did not argue Misaira. He debated the issue, he went through the issue. And there, there are, there's testimony of other G'day uh, the, the Yeshua Malka, the Yeshua Kutna did also had a tremendous amount of back and forth, there were chulis and written back and forth, and he debated it on the face of the issue. He did not resort. If it was a simple issue that our ancestors didn't do it, then there's no room for debate. Why did he bother with it? What turned out, or was discovered at a later time, was that although the blood element of the cuttlefish played a role in the um, color of the Radzina's Tchelis, but what turned out later on was that any uh, or many forms of blood, um, ox blood and other animals, could have performed the same feat. Again, the Radzina Chesidim and other Gedalim continued to support that despite that, uh, that fact. It's questionable whether or not the Radzina ever knew about the Murex snail. It's entirely possible that he did, and like many others who dabbled with the issue, they did not, he couldn't use it because it didn't produce a blue uh, dye, it, produ it produced a purple dye. So let's fast forward. Uh, I believe it was in the late 70s, early 80s, which means that it was recent history, that um, a Talmud Chacham in Eretz Yisrael, again, threw himself into the, the issue and researched the topic and once again began to tamper with the uh, Murex snail, which is a Mediterranean snail, located exactly where the Torah describes uh, that the Chilazan would be found. We'll get back to that in a moment. And although it produced purple when 
they were working with the dye one day, and I can testify this personally, it stinks. The uh, flesh of this thing has a terrible odor, and it was a hot day, and instead of working with it indoors, they took it outdoors. The piece of wool that they were working with changed from blue to, changed from purple to blue, meaning the liquid begins clear, and when you pull out the uh, piece of wool that you dip into the solution, normally within several moments, if you're indoors, it turns purple. One of these two is purple. I am colorblind, and I can't tell the difference between them. Okay, this one is the blue one, I think, because it has a paper clip on it. Um, if you take it outdoors, it turns blue rather than purple. Um, and that drove an entire new research into this murex snail, um, which resulted in, once again, the launching of the interest in the tchelis. Let's, let's just create some broad, some broad outline here uh, that will help us process the, um, the information. There are numerous chazals, divrei chazal to be correct, that mention the chilozeh, which is the sea creature from which the color of tchelis needs to be derived. And the way the Rishonim process the various Gemaras is that some of the Divrei Chazal are points of identification, meaning Chazal recorded them because we are to learn from them how to identify which one is the Chilozim, whereas other comments of Chazal are, are teaching us other lessons and are not to be used as points of identification. The Rambam is very clear about how he identifies the Chiloza. And the summary of the points of identity used by Chazal are, and again, there is some controversy about this, but the, the uh, Maskona is that A, the Tchelis color is only kosher if it is derived from a Chiloza. B, is that the blue dye that comes from it must be a steadfast, strong color that doesn't wash out and that doesn't fade. That's the second qualification. Um, the third is that it has to produce a blue color. Tchelis dem the yam, yam dem the rakia, rakia dem the kisya covered. Those are the three identifying qualities. Based on those three identifying qualities, the Murex trunculus, however it's pronounced, snail, is that that meets those three criteria. Let's discuss how that is. The term Chilazen is brought in numerous places in Chazal. And the way Chazal identify it is a creature whose nartic, whose shell grows with it. Okay, clearly the snail, this is a, uh, my own pet murex. The snail part of it, thank God, is not in here. <laughs> so, it is, uh, there, there are small murexes and there are big murexes. It depends on how old they are and how far developed they are, but clearly their shell grows with it, the nautic grows with it. There are numerous places throughout uh, Chazal and the Rishonim that translate Chilazim as a shneke, as a snail, or the, the word of uh, that Rashi uses is a limsa, which in French means a snail. Similarly, it's also translated as a worm or a slug. And one of the great benefits of being a snail is that you get to use both of those translations simultaneously. You can be both a snail and a slug and a worm all wrapped up in one, no puns intended. The other thing that you find, which is fascinating, again, in several Rishonim, is that they question whether the Chilazim is a Chai or a Tzemeach. 
Meaning, is it a living creature or is it a, a plant? And the reason that they give for it is that it just sits there and does nothing. And unless you sit and watch a snail for a long period of time, you're not going to see any action. And therefore, they want to say that it is really some middle ground between a tzameach and a chai, that it's really not entirely either one. The maril, the marshal, the bach, the malbim, all define the term chilozen as a schneck. A schneck in German and in Yiddish is a snail. In fact, in Arabic and in Farsi, to this very day, the term for snail is chilozen, as well as in Aramaic, even in modern Aramaic, the term is a halazuna, and I'm sure I'm mispronouncing the hey ches sound. So the identification through, again, through using Chazal and numerous Rishonim and Achreinim is clear that Echilozim is a snail, a slug, and that uh, the um, murex certainly fits that description. The Gemar Chulin asks the question, why did HaKadosh Baruch choose the Tcheves of all other colors? And that's where the Gemara comes up with the conclusion that the um, color of Tcheves is comparable to the sea, and the sea is comparable to the uh, sky, and the sky reminds us of the Kisiyah Kovit. Just as a, a moment of humor, there's a, um, a Godel in Eretz Yisrael, his name is Ermeidach Bideman, he's a, a popular figure, my, uh, many of my children were great fans of his. So someone once challenged him and said, how can it be possibly be that this is the real Tcheles, if I know so many people who wear it, and they don't look like the kinds of people who are thinking much about the Kisiyah Kovit. So his response was, he says, I could bring you a raya that you're wrong. He said, because Chazal tell us that the Tcheles is done with the Yam, and the Yam is done with the Rikia, and the Rikia is done with the Kisei HaKovet. He says, I know a lot of people that are on the beaches itself. They don't even have to use the first step, and they're also not thinking about the Rikia and the Kisei HaKovet. <laughs> so the, the fact that they're not thinking doesn't mean anything. It just means that we're not using the opportunity of the mitzvah properly. The Rambam in Hilchus Titus clearly states that the color of the Tcheles is, the Tcheles is Tzemer, it's wool, it's colored, Kipatuch Shabikhail, which is a, a diluted blue, and its color is like the, the sky in, the, in, in midday, in mid afternoon. And there, the, again, the Raman writes that its color has to be a, a, a fast color that will not change. And he says explicitly, anything not colored with that dye is puzzled at tzitzis, even though it is the exact same color. For instance, if someone were to color it, the astis or bashaka or anything else that would give it that color, it is not kosher. Now, we all know from Rashi and Chomish, that the uh, Rashi quotes the Chazal. The Chazal tells us that Hakadosh Baruch Hu will take to task anyone who attempts to sell tzitzis dyed with kloilon. And kloilon is defined by Chazal as a color called indigo, which was a plant. Still is a plant. It can be derived, I believe, from several sources and plants. The color is a, uh, a much cheaper version of the same color. And the Rebbe Shalom warns us that he will take account for someone who attempts to pull off and sell um, indigo dyed tzitzis in place <coughs> of real tzitzis. And what is very clear from that Gemara is that obviously if you're going to try selling it to somebody it's got to be the same color. The Murex Treves is both chemically and visually the exact same color as the indigo. Um, and that argument gets used interestingly both 
for and against the murex, but as far as the purpose of what we're trying to call upon the correct color, it is chemically the exact same color as indigo. The Gemara says that there's a test uh, that one can use. There's actually two tests that one can use to distinguish. If you happen to buy some and you want to know if you were sold indigo or you were sold uh, real tailors, there is a process that one can go through uh, in order to figure that out. Continues the Rambam. How does one dye this tchelis? He takes wool, uh, puts, it, puts the wool into sulfur to, form a, uh, to process, to make the wool susceptible, to clean the wool. And then one uh, washes it out until it's totally clean and heats it up as the dyeing industry does in order that it will absorb the color. And then one brings the dam of chilazayim Says the Rambam, that is a dag, and we need to remember that when the uh, Chazal and the Rishon used the term dag, anything that lived in the sea was referred to as a dag, was referred to as a, a fish, is not the way we distinguish between fish and shellfish, and, and, and there's one point where, where Chazal referring to a crocodile, and they call it a dag. Um... Then the Ramam says, dog should hayam. It's look. We'll talk about this in a moment. It looks like the sea. And Vidoma Shachar Kidyoy and its blood is black like ink. Obiyama Melech Humatsu and it is found in the Yamamelech that does not refer to the Dead Sea. The Ramam refers to the Mediterranean as the Yamamelech. And it's put into a pot and one puts in other chemicals, says the Rambam, to make it uh, uh, hold to the wool, and one puts in the wool until it turns the color of the sky, and that is Tchelis of Tzitzis. Now, there are many different approaches. If you go through the various svarim, and there are excellent svarim, and some that I will recommend, and some that I won't recommend, um, that go through the the process and different approaches, whether one wants to use scientific evidence and archaeological evidence, one can get through the proofs as we just did without mentioning anything about archaeology. Simply by using the simonim given to us by Chazal, this uh, trellis meets those descriptions. But the argument that will um, perhaps kind of close the, close the loop here, is a Gemara in Erevin. The Gemara says as follows. Amr um, Yehuda, Amr Balaza. Someone who finds Tcheles in the Shuk. Someone who finds Tcheles in the marketplace, in a public place. Says the Gemara, it depends what form they find it in. If they find large, if you look at the way they do it, they... they the um, tailus is not dyed when it's already in strings because then the dye only adheres to the outside. So you take loose wool and you dye it and then you turn it into strings. Okay? So if you find large bundles of wool dyed blue, they are puzzle. They cannot be used for tzitzis. However, if one finds chutin, if you find um, a ready-made thread, that is kosher for tzitzis, says the Gemara. Why is large bundles, why are large bundles of word wool not kosher? So most of us would have immediately said, because maybe it's indigo, right? That's not what the Gemara says. That can be tested using the, the, the great urine test. We're not worried about that. Says the Gemara, what are we worried about? were worried that this wool that came in large bundles was not dyed nishma. That's what we're worried about. Meaning that when somebody takes the wool and puts it into the, the uh, chemical mixture that's going to make the white wool blue, they have to do it with shame mitzvah stitzis. If anybody goes to the factory, you'll see that they stand there and they say, shame mitzvah stitzis, it has to be done 
for the purposeful um, use of the tzitzis to such a degree where the Gemara in Menachus talks about it, they, when they say that, you, that in order for any quality person who knows how to die, you don't want to make a big pot and dye all your wool and then find out that the color is wrong. So you do something called te'ima, and trust me, I've smelled the stuff, nobody's tasting it. Te'ima means testing it for color. So they take a little piece, the Gemara says they take it in an eggshell, you dip in a piece of wool, you hold it out until it changes color, you see that it's the right color, otherwise you need to adjust some of the chemicals. Says the Gemara, if someone were to take that piece of wool and leave it around, somebody might come to use that piece of wool by mistake to make tzitzis out of it. Says the Gemara, you got to burn it. Because it's a mikshel. Not only that, says the Gemara, but if you were to take the leftovers that's in the eggshell and put it back into the pot, you ruin the whole pot. Because some of it was not lishma. So the Gemara says, if you find big bundles of wool, it is, um, you cannot use it for tzitzis because it was probably made to make a shirt, a blue shirt that wasn't made for tzitzis at all. It was made to make other garments. And therefore, it was not made the shame tzitzis. You can't use it. Says the Gemara, yeah. what about threads? Threads are also used in making garments. So why are threads kosher? Says the Gemara, we're talking about that they are um, shizurim, that they're they're already twined. There's there's more than one thread there, so they turned it, and we know that tzitzis are made from more than one thread. So that points to the fact that they were made for the purpose of tzitzis. Why else would you take them and twist them? Says the Gemara, maybe he was using it for tassels. Maybe he was really making a beautiful blue shirt and wanted to have blue tassels. And there you do use um, twisted strands. Says the Gemara, they were chopped at the exact length used for tzitzis, the wrong length for tassels, and as a result, you know for sure that they were made for tzitzis. Okay? So listen to this. You find, it has to be made lishma, the Gemara says. And you find beautiful, twisted tzitzis looking strings that look like tzitzis on the street and because they're the right length and they're, 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 they're twisted the right way you can assume that they were made with shema and you're allowed to use them now we know that the Gemara told us that if the wool is kla'ilan, if it's indigo then it's puzzle why aren't we worried that the, these strings are neither indigo, because you can test that, nor are they tailless, but they're really murex that was left out in the sun, and they're puzzled. Why didn't the Gemara address the fact that we need to be afraid that this was actually blue wool, but it's made from a puzzle snail named murex? So your only argument would be, well, they didn't know how to make blue wool out of murex in the times of the Gemara. First of all, it's an unreasonable argument because, again, I was told that before I was born, air conditioning was not that popular. Eretz Yisrael gets hot during the summer. There was a huge industry of dying in Eretz Yisrael. Is someone going to suggest that for the hundreds of years that they were there, dyeing purple wool, nobody ever walked outside with the uh, mixture and say, wow, this isn't purple, this turned blue. It never happened all those years. It's simply not a reasonable uh, possibility. What's more is one might argue, well, this snail didn't exist. Bimei Chazal. Again, not a reasonable argument. Um, again, without touching the fact that archaeology has found tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of these exact snails in the exact area that Chazal tell us that the, the industry was making um, this dye.
Let's address the Ben Salavi's question. What about the Misur? What about the negative Misur? If this existed, and we believe that the Murex snail existed all the years, why weren't they dying with it? Why was it? Why did it disappear? It's very clear if you follow the trace of the, the path of the Gemara, when the Gemara talks about how does one make Tchelas, and the Gemara records the Amirayim talking about exactly how they did it. And then the Gemara talks about how there was less Tchelas available. And then the Gemara further talks about the fact that one Amirayim says to another that there was a, a carrier who was bringing Tchelas from one place to another and was caught by the authorities and by miracle alone through Rachamim got away with his life. What's going on? The Ramban in Chumash talking about the Big Day Kahuna says that the Tchelas was outlawed by the government. And what happened was, again, just to revert for a moment, the Ramban is enough for us, but if one goes looks back at the source of this, the government, I believe it was the Roman government, decreed that the royal purple and the royal blue be used only by the emperor himself, and it was the color of royalty. It started off slow, and it came to the point where they have these documents readily available for anybody to see, where the penalty was the death penalty. So, the, the reason that the entire industry came to a halt wasn't because they didn't know how to do it, and wasn't because they didn't know what the sea creature was. The reason it came to a halt was because it came at the penalty of life itself. And as a result, to answer the Mesa Levy's opposition to it, there is very good reason why it was nishtakach, or to use the words of Chazal, why it was nignaz. The tchelis was nignaz because it was illegal. And it wasn't just some illegal like things today are illegal, like speeding is illegal. It was illegal to the point where one would pay for it with their life. Now, in mentioning that Chazal, and many attempt, and again the Redzina addresses this, if it says that the Tcheves was Nignaz, what business do we have attempting to find it? Or is it perhaps even heresy to say that if Chazal say it was Nignaz, well that should be proof that this can't be it, because Chazal say that it was concealed and we don't have access to it. Now, again, the Talmud HaChachamim, go into all kinds of analysis of all the times the word Mignaz is used in Shas, or in the Midrashim. And does it mean Nishtakach? Does it mean that it was forgotten? Or does it actually mean that it was concealed? And there's a, a, a great Medumbra about it. I'd like to just throw in another um, piece in the puzzle here. And that is that the Mekubalim point to the Arizal, where the Arizal says that when there is no Besa Mikdash, there is no Tchelas. And many of the Hasidim, as well as the other Mikubalim, use that as their reason for not wearing Tcheles. Varayad Arizal says that when there's no Bishamikdash, there is no Tcheles. The problem with that argument is that the entire period of the Amiroi and into the time of the Ga'inim, they still wore Tcheles. And that entire period of time, the Bishamikdash did not exist. And therefore, how do we understand the Arizal? Answer number one is we don't have to understand the Arizal. Answer number two is for those who do understand the Arizal, they say that the Arizal's explanation is to help us understand why the Rebbeinu Shalom would have made it that there is a time in which we don't have access to a mitzvah. And Alpi Kabbali explains that when there is no Beis Amikdash, there is not a need for Tcheles. But Ichas Rishon is not coming to say that one should not wear Tcheles, He's coming to explain why it is possible that the Rebbeinu Shalom would have taken it away and explains that it's not the end of Judaism because when the Beis Amikdash isn't around, there's not such a desperate need for Tcheles.
So it's in the Rebbe says that he has a Kabbalah, that before you might say Mashiach, that the, uh, from the Kajan Tzimagid, that before you might say Mashiach, that the um, Tcheles, that the Tcheles would once again be revealed. And that was really a driving force in his quest to uncover the Tcheles. There's a very interesting tshuva from the South Merom Zuchan al in his Shadis of Tshuvas. And he, <coughs> first he attempts to address, there's another claim that the Radzini Rebbe also addresses, which is that uh, some claim that all mitzvahs have to be min hamutah b'ficha, that they have to be something which is permissible to eat. And there are many proofs, uh, namely the, the color of our gaman came from a unkosher animal. Um, and there's some of it that deals with that issue. And then he says, very clever, that perhaps in an explanation of what the Arizal was saying, as to why the Tcheles would be concealed when the Besamekdash is not around. So he says, very clever, he says that the, um, the Gemara says in Brachis, Tavnantes, that from the day the Besamekdash was destroyed, the sky is no longer the same color. So he says that if the whole Tachlis of uh, the Tcheves is because the color of Tcheves is the Yam, and the Yam is the Rekia. So if the Rekia is the wrong color, he says it throws off the whole mitzvah. So it's only this mantra, it's a Mikdash Ayakayam, that really that the real color of the Rekia would be revealed in, so that the Tcheves would be able to fulfill its purpose. And then he says, Ubi Amea Purim Amarti. Sabram says that over the, uh, the Yontem of Purim, he explained. Why it is that we say Shashan is the Akim to all of the Samecha, Biroisa Miyacha Tcheles Mordechai. So he says, everybody rejoiced when they saw the Tcheles of Mordechai. Why didn't they rejoice when they saw the golden crown? We're Jewish. Right? Why, the golden crown should have been a much bigger deal than the Tcheles of Mordechai. So he says this, he says, he says that before the Geula, he says, Taka, when Kla Yisrael and Golos, they didn't wear Tcheles. They weren't able to wear Tcheles. He said, when all of a sudden Mordechai walked out wearing Tcheles, they saw that there was his night at Sosagula, that the time Taka was coming in, and Taka immediately after that story, they began to rebuild the Besamikdash. So there was the restoration of Tcheles. And you see from this Tshuva, the Sabarov, that this concept of the, um, the, Tcheles being revealed before the times of Mashiach is a, uh, a very real issue and it's something that should, should grab our attention. just want to um, share another few uh, issues here that, that the Paiskin address in the identities of the Tcheles. One of the things that the Gemara says is that the Tcheles is the uh, Chilozai is Daim of the Yam. Let me just get the Gemara here. Okay, Gufay. Chilozan said, Gufay Daim of the Yam. The Chilozan, its body is Daim of the Yam. Its body, again, the word Daim is a Chamtzvi that talks about what the word Daimah means, what does similar mean, it means it's not exact, when it's a Daimah Ladag, then it's similar to a fish. So, what's interesting is, what is the translation of Yam? Normally we translate the Yam as a sea, right? But, more often, the Yam is the bed, the sea bed. Like the Pesach says that the world will be filled with knowledge like the water covers the sea referring to the seabed. Anybody who's ever seen one of these um, murexes, and there's a, a movie that's available where they're virtually invisible on the seabed, the chilozen is daimaliyam. It, it is virtually impossible, unless you know exactly what you're looking for, it's virtually impossible to see them on the seabed. The, um, another one of the perches is the fact that Chazal say that it comes up once in 70 years. There's no record whatsoever of these snails 
coming up once in 70 years. It's interesting that one of the Rishonim, and I'm not remembering who it is, says that it's talking about the lifespan of a murex, and that if left alone, they could live 70 years, and after 70 years, they die and float to the top. Um, that's in direct contrast to what one of the other Mepharshim explained, that that miracle of the fact that all of a sudden, once every 70 years, these murexes would come out of the water was a nace that took place for Kal Yisrael that allowed us to easily fulfill the mitzvah because otherwise it takes a great deal of effort to catch these things. Which leads us to another one of the issues, and that is, the Gemara specifically says that the malacha of Tzayid, of Tzayda, applies to the Chilazim. Trapping on Shabbos is prohibited. And we all know that trapping on Shabbos generally applies to things like deer that are hard to catch. However, if it's a snail, why would the malacha of Tzayid apply if it's standing right there for your taking? The answer to that is that it's very clear that anything that requires a technique to get it involves the Malach of Tzayid. And anybody who knows anything about the industry of how they capture these things, they are extremely elusive, and it requires traps and nets and baskets and food and all different kinds of things to get these things to come to the traps. And therefore, they clearly are, um, the Malach of Tzayid applies. The, um, the other language that the Gemara Menachos use is Ubriyosai Daima Ledaim. This has been one of the, the big sticking points. That is that it's Briyosai, again, just translate the Gemara, it's creation is Daima Ledaim, is similar to a fish. What do you mean? It is a fish. What does it mean it's Daima Ledaim? So there's a lot of debating back and forth, again, beginning from, from way back then. The Aruch, explicitly says that what it means is that whatever this creature is, is shaped like a fish. It's narrow at one end and is wide in the middle. And if you take a look at the silhouette of a murex, it is shaped, and if you make a shadow with it, it is shaped exactly like a fish, just like the, the Aruch says. Um, there are those who want to say Gufay Doyma Liyam is that it is, if you take a look at them, they're made with waves, that it has, it, it's similar to the sea in that regard. There are those who want to say that they're a blue-green color. This one was cleaned up already, so it's not blue-green, but they are full of algae when they are in the, in the sea, and they look like the sea. Um, what are some of the other arguments here? Now, I told the uh, good rabbi who invited me here, that I was going to present a fairly balanced presentation. <laughs> so let me attempt to offer you some reasons um, that could possibly be um, arguments against the Tchelis. Um, I, and I spoke to several of the Talmud HaChachamim who, it, I got to tell you that it was such a refreshing experience to speak to these Yudalai, both in Eretz Yisrael and uh, one of them in Lakewood who's writing extensively on the topic and their breadth of knowledge and open-mindedness and clarity in the sugya was really an, just an exceptional experience. It was very hard to get off the phone. Um, just that their passion and excitement about sharing their findings and, and trying to convert people to uh, wearing tchelis. One argument was that, and I'm, I'm my you know, kind of my display here today doesn't work with that argument, but the argument is that anything that cannot be proved in the Bismedish itself Without, without the assistance of science and or archaeology is not valid halakha unto itself. Um, when I shared this argument with others, um, I, I got some very, very angry responses because there are uh, Divrei Chazal as well as Rishonim 
and the Ahreinim that Paskin based both on science, certainly in archaeology. One of the arguments for, for and against Rabbeinu Tam's tomb is about the fact that they found a pair of tefillin in the Kivri Anavim. And some used this in support, and others said, no, that's why it was buried. <laughs> and whatever the case is, the argument, you clearly see that they utilized it. One of the arg- other arguments that you see the Gemara says about the Mitzvah Tzitzis, and they said, well, why don't you go and dig up the Mesa Midbar and see what they were wearing? Well, that's archaeology. Um, so there are, there are many other places where both science and archaeology are utilized. The stipler himself, in his attempt to verify the sizes of various shiurim, encourage those of you he was working with to utilize the scientific and archaeological evidence to verify the various shiurim. Um, the one argument that really um, was a, a serious argument, and I believe is the one gaping hole remaining for the uh, Trelis movement to cover, is that there are numerous shittis and how you should tie the tzitzis. How many strings one should wear of Trelis. The Rambam says that we have eight strands, meaning two <coughs> doubled over uh, strings, four. The Rambam says that one half string should be blue. The Ravid says that it's one full string that should be blue. The Rashi and Taisvis say that it should be two full strings. Now, that being the case, one who does any one of the shittas may risk transgressing Baltigra or Baltaisif by either having too many or too few strings. I don't understand necessarily, let me, let me first let that sink in for a minute so that I did my job of presenting a argument, counter-argument. Okay? That was very convincing, right? Good. Now, why is the Baltigra or Baltaisif of not wearing Tredis at all Baltigra, not wearing Tredis at all, worse than the Baltigra or Baltis have been involved in wearing the incorrect number of strings. So, that argument, again, requires, and, and plus, what's interesting is that Shiflis, Tredis is mentioned in Shulchan Aruch several times as being the, kind of the accepted uh, the accepted psaq, although most, I, I believe that most Chayz wearers do not uh, fear Zuch like that, because it wasn't around necessarily in the uh, in the times of the Shulchan Aruch, and it's used mostly for um, an argument, in the form of an argument as a, as a, a step stool to something else. Um, many will argue, and you will hear this all over the place, that if this is so, where are the G'day Yisrael that are wearing Tchelis? Um, I can tell you that there are many G'day Yisrael who are wearing Tchelis, far more than the world would like to believe. Many of them are wearing it under their garments. Um, the numbers of G'day Yisrael that are starting to wear Tchelis are growing. Uh, every, uh, I don't know if it's every day, but certainly on a regular basis. And what's most amusing is that when you ask any one of the G'day Yisrael why they're not wearing it, they all say that when the G'day Yisrael start to wear it, they will put it on also. <laughs> and I'm being serious. That really is the response of many G'day Yisrael, that they are waiting for G'day Yisrael to put it on. Um, in the many attempts to get to the G'day Yisrael, the efforts of those who have attempted to get to people like Rav Yashiv. Um, I know that j- just several weeks ago, someone very close to Rav Kanyevsky went into Rav Chaim and made a very strong argument, and Rav Chaim actually gave him some time. And when he finished, Rav Chaim said to him, you should understand that if you are so convinced of its validity that you are chayv to wear it. He didn't dismiss it. 
Shlomo Zalman's son-in-law, Rabbi Zalman Nechem Goldberg, a place in his own right, as well as uh, the Rav of Kiryat Sefer, of Karaf, and, and many others, uh, Rabbi Sobelski, are wearing uh, Tchelis, as well, are, as well as some of the Rosh Yeshiva in Shari Shemayim, the among the Mikubalim. So, um, I encourage you, there's a, um, a fabulous Kuntris, if you want to do more research into it, uh, it's called Lavush Ha'aren. If you want, I will give you the uh, the site where you can download it. It's an impressive uh, article. There's an article that my cousin Rabbi Chaim Tursky printed years ago in the uh, Journal of uh, Halacha, Contemporary uh, Halacha, the RJJ Journal, where you can uh, glean a lot of this information. Um, and there are several svarim. There's a Shlomo Teitelbaum who printed a sefer Luloyes Atchelis. Um, and again, there's this consistent development going on. Um, I just learned last night that there's a, a breakaway group of B'nai Torah, um, you know, what we would call an anti the Haredi B'nai Torah, who have created their own Tchelis company using the same Yerix Tchelis, uh, but it, now it's being done by people with black hats, for those who that would be made... For some reason, if you feel more comfortable with tchelis made by people with black hats, that is now available as well. I'm, I'm 100% serious. I'm, I'm not joking. Um, so if that works for you, that you know you could you could get that too. Um, again, anybody who has any questions on the matter, my cousin will be eager and glad to respond to that. Thank you for listening. Uh,